today we're going to be talking about an interesting story and we'll have two stories to discuss and you, you'll see why. So please join me in welcoming the co-founder of Shazam, uh, Diraj Mukherjee. Welcome Diraj. And we'll be talking to the founder of a company called MyPick, and you'll soon find why, Carl Thomas. Welcome, Carl. <laughs> so the limitation is we're going to have to share the microphone, but I, I, I hope you can uh, be okay with that. Now, uh, this, story, uh, this story started uh, uh, many years ago, uh, because as you know, Shazam is a company which was born uh, around 2000, which is uh, 19 years old, but uh, the big story here, which we're going to be focusing on, uh, started uh, four years ago. But uh, let's go into into the, into the Shazam story and, and why you wanted to uh, solve the pain. What was the pain at the beginning? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm not sure if, if this is working. Um, there we go. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me. First and foremost, and. Um, yeah, it's too late to try to hide my age. Shazam's a very old business. We started in, uh, in 2000, and simply because my business partner, Chris, and I, we were hopeless at music. We'd go out and like hear songs in bars and restaurants, and we had no idea what it was. And he would say, what song is this? I'm like, I don't know, you, you tell me. And, and so it was literally born of a, of a personal thing. And we wanted to be entrepreneurs. We, we thought it'd be like a really cool thing to do. Um, <laughs> And we just didn't have any ideas, but that's what led to the idea for, for Shazam. Um, I mean, there's a whole bunch of problems. For instance, we knew nothing about technology. Uh, it seemed like there would be some technology involved. Uh, we did very limited experience with music um, and, and, and so on and so forth, but that's how it started. Uh, technology was really basic at the beginning and uh, you were kind of text-based. Can you describe why and, and how did it work actually? Yeah, so this was uh, before smartphones even existed. So uh, the idea which we came up with was it would be a voice call to uh, a voice response system. So it would be a 15 second call. It would record the music, match it against a database of a million songs, and then the user would get a text message with the name of the song and the artist. Um, people in the front row are laughing openly. Yes, it wasn't a great day. <laughs> It wasn't a great user experience, but it was the best we could do back in the dark ages. How did the founding team come together? How many of you were? Well, there were three of us initially. We, we were drinking buddies. I mean, um, <laughs> so Chris and Philippe were at Berkeley Business School together. I, I knew Chris from San Francisco. It was, it, it was 1999. It was the height of the dot-com boom. We're like, this is great. We're going to change the world. We're going to have like a giant beer fund. Uh, so that's how we started. Yeah. Okay. And the company came together, and uh, at the beginning, what was the biggest pain points you had to go through? Um, the biggest pain points uh, basically were we didn't have uh, the technology, we didn't have uh, a business model, we didn't have any of the music, and we didn't have a team. Other than that, it was pretty straight. Wow, wow. I'll probably give up at the step number two, but... Uh, yeah. And that's the point, you persevered, and when did you feel this is something actually which could be a, a valid business? You know, it, it started off pretty well because uh, what we knew from the initial founding team, we were three MBAs. Uh, we needed somebody smart, and so we went around trying to find uh, an inventor for the technology. And it turns out that the experts were in the San Francisco Bay Area at Stanford and Berkeley. And we managed to somehow con a genius called Dr. Avery Wang into joining the team. Um, I just got back from California today and I got him to tell me the story in his words. And he was sitting in a cafe trying to invent this technology and he was like on the verge of giving up because it was a massive scientific breakthrough which he had to achieve on these like work plans which us clever MBAs had, had developed, which is you've got three months to invent this thing. And he was literally like, uh, he, was, he, was, he was, I mean, uh, trying to, tr argue his way out of the situation when he had this light bulb moment. Um, on the back of that, we built a demo. We were able to raise a million dollars in, uh, in seed funding, uh, which enabled us to hire the team. Uh, and then we did all kinds of clever tricks to get a gigantic uh, database of, of uh, digital music in the UK. But that's when things started going wrong, because you would expect after two years of business school, I would have learned you need a business model. Uh, but we didn't have one. So we just were hemorrhaging cash. 
uh, and uh, yeah, it was very awkward uh, to, put, to put in mind. Is this thing recorded? I hope not. <laughs> Quite a little bit, yes. Uh, you know, technology is, is, is great that you made it, and uh, I actually listened to this uh, uh, VP of uh, technology uh, of engineering uh, Shazam a couple of years ago at VPC, and she said, uh, uh, that the Shazam technology enables you to know a few days before a song becomes a hit, that it's gonna become a hit. So it's, it's a super strong technology. But how did you convince the music studios or the owners of the music to let you listen in to the, to the songs? Yeah, so what we did basically was we had a partnership with a, a distributor of music in the UK and we created from scratch on the back of our funding uh, the first catalog of music fingerprints. And we use that uh, to power the algorithm which Adriel developed. So we don't use the full tracks at all. So it, we didn't need the licenses and the agreements of uh, the music label. Okay, very, very smart. Is there anybody here who does not use Shazam or have never heard about it? Please raise your hand. Okay, we, we all know it. Fair enough. Um, what are your key takeaways from the Shazam story? Yeah, I mean, the, um, the first part of the story, it was all fun and games, but. Um, when we found that we just were not able to raise money, we were looking uh, at bankruptcy in the face. Uh, the dot-com bubble had burst. It was you know, impossible to raise funding in, in the UK. People were going back to their jobs. So B2B was back to banking and B2C was back to consulting. Like people were <laughs> running for their lives. Okay. Uh, there was dead startups everywhere. And uh, you know, we were literally up the creek. Uh, so we did whatever it took, and at one point we sold um, our crown jewel, which was the the core technology, uh, to another company uh, in order to raise money just to be able to survive for, for another day. And we were really lucky because uh, the, the game changer for us was uh, when the iPhone launched in 2007, the, the App Store launched in 2008, and Shazam became an app. Then finally it became a sensible user experience. Finally we started seeing some growth. And we managed to, you know, claw back uh, from the brink of extinction, and um, we uh, bought back our technology eventually, uh, and then raised, an, uh, you know, several rounds, um, and uh, you know, sold the business to Apple uh, late last year. But the takeaway for me was, you know, if you don't have quality people around you to get you through those hard times, it's really tough because every entrepreneur goes through these, these hard times. That's true. The second thing I think is just you know having the the, the grit and the, the the determination to make it through those uh, those really tough patches, like including, for instance, I had to lay off people who were part of our founding team that we worked together literally from the first week. It's very painful, um, and uh, yeah, I guess that uh, we just never never took no for an answer. We never we never stopped believing that we could pull this out of the fire, but. Uh, yeah, it was a long journey from start to end, you know, 18 years from beginning to end, and a lot of it was not fun again. Yeah, so it's an 18 years old uh, overnight success. Uh, <laughs> it didn't work out for me, the overnight success bit. But I love that you, you were fighting back and you just didn't give up, and even though technology was lost, you, you, you got it back. That's awesome. Uh, so congrats on, on not giving up. Uh, Carl, uh, to you, what is your what is your story, and uh, what's your background first? I don't think... Uh, People know my app as much as him at the moment, but maybe after today you should. Um, you have 18 years. With a background on me, <laughs> 18 years ago, <laughs> I was in Liverpool. Um, yeah, I'm an architect by trade. Um, I finished my master's in 2009. Um, my pick kind of started through a, a hobby to, to create digital imagery as a physical product. So during my time as a, an architecture student, I set up an art shop where I would print my own art and photography, I would take other people's imagery and enhance them and edit them and, and Photoshop basically became my tool to uh, to showcase really cool products. What is the thing you're trying to solve with that? Well, uh, at, at, the, at the time I was a very cash strapped student. Um, architecture, as we know, is a 10 year course or eight years. Uh, so I formed quite a, a nice business in Liverpool uh, just as a weekend job and when I moved down to London in 2010, uh, obviously I got chartered in 2013. Uh, I wanted to try and recreate that model in London, but instead of 
spending Saturday mornings on my mother's living room floor with a hammer and a staple gun. I thought, well, let's, let's try and create a service that allows everybody in the room to be able to print products which are as good as uh, the high-end retailers but affordable for everybody. Um, yeah, I wanted to, to solve that, that problem of creativity for everyone without having to physically build the products themselves. Okay, and what key challenges did you face at the beginning? At the beginning, um, having no money. Uh, six months after getting chartered, I just had an itch that I needed to scratch. I was building my pick in my bedroom for a year with two developers. Um, not all of us in the same room, we were on Skype. Uh, that would have been a bit strange. Um, but yeah, we basically, we built a beta for a year and it got to the point where it was either I continue with architecture or uh, just take the leap of faith, basically. Um, I quite often remember lunch times in the office where I would hide in a meeting, in the director's meeting room, and I'd be up on the phone trying to call manufacturers, um, pretending that I was this big company called MyPick, wanting to, to partner with them for uh, fabrication, and they're like, no, no, no. So that was that was quite painful. But when uh, there was a contact in Liverpool who introduced me to someone in London, I'll never forget uh, pitching to the director of a print company in Starbucks in Clapham Junction with two old ladies next to it. And I was on an iPad showing them the, the website. And the two ladies just said, this looks really good, doesn't it? <laughs> All right. and then the, the guy kind of, uh, he said, yeah, we'll start work on it tomorrow. So we, we basically partnered with a, a London print company to, to create prints for us uh, without us touching the product. And uh, so the challenges were, you saying, the, the product with the, with the funding? Yeah, so yeah. early stages uh, basically had no savings, so wow. it was a Barclays loan, 12k. Oh, wow. Quit my job, I had six months survival money, um, so yeah, 12k in the tank and that was it. Okay, and what led you to, uh, to, to meet the guy? How did you first meet him? Well, there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a story in between, so basically we, we turned the website on. Um, fortunately, my pick is an existing hashtag, which is a Spanish word, me pick. So at the time we had no, no budget for marketing and we just found that there was users in South America and Spain and we're like, oh, what's happening here? And then my Spanish friend, oh yeah, it's a Spanish word. Oh God, that, it was meant to be, that, that was purpose. Um, but yeah, we basically, it was just me full time in the bedroom for the first three or four months. And uh, we, we saw a, an invite to an entrepreneur business plan day with Virgin. So I headed up there and uh, the business plan event was cancelled and it was teeming with rain. I went from Clapham to Paddington and uh, basically this receptionist asked me what we did. So I showed her the business card and she said, oh, she looked at the logo and said, you need to go upstairs and just wait and sit there. Um, long story short, uh, two hours later, I spent with the, the, the finance guy at Virgin and he said, we sh you should enter a competition called Pitch to Rich. The deadline is today at midday. Um, so, okay. so we entered the competition and then a month later I was in front of Richard Branson at his house at Oxford and we won the competition and it was all thanks to that receptionist who told well, us about Oxford. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So following that, crowdfunding, so um, we had a few experiences with angel investors. Um, so you raised before uh, the competition? Or no, no it, was, it was strictly my own money up to, the, to build the beta okay. and then when we won Pitch to Rich there was a couple of thousand that we won through the Virgin, mm -hmm. which was good exposure, and then we decided to um, go through crowdfunding with Crowdcube. Um, and how was the experience? Very stressful. So uh -huh. basically, if, you, if you're raising crowdfunding, don't just turn a campaign on without speaking to investors first. Yeah. Because back in 2015, the campaigns were three months long. So I had to basically pedal on my own for two months to find investors and meet mm -hmm. them. And then that's when the funding would, would hit the, the yeah. pot. Um, but obviously they're a lot shorter now, so the key is do your investment meeting before and then put the money in and then kind of ramp up the campaign afterwards. Okay, and now uh, you went through the crowdfunding, you, you won the competition, so it seems like it was going well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we raised uh, 170,000 on Crowdcube. Um, so yeah, with that cash, we built our version one, if you say. Um, we took through the team from London and partnered with an Argentinian agency. So we outsourced the kind of front-end development, designed it all in-house, and then built it in Argentina. Okay, and uh, then, uh, from what you told me earlier, you hit like a low point. Yeah, so six months 
past Crowdcube, we just turned the website on. We did seven days a week, 20 hour days, yeah. got it live for Christmas, um, and then we were due to receive a, a follow on investment round. Um, the terms slightly tweaked, and we didn't really think that they were in the, the best interest of the business. Yeah. Um, so we decided to move on from, from that situation and, and, and try and raise cash. Um, but we, our roadmap was based on a certain amount of money hitting the account. And as I said before about when you, when you look three or four weeks down the line, there's not much money left in the account, then you're staring death in the face. Um, but we, just, we decided to not go down that route and just basically I had to then raise cash again on my own. So it was a case of huge high of ecstasy of launching the, the platform and then having to try and find new funding. And how do you solve that? Well, how did we solve that? Uh, so we finished with the Argentinian team and yeah. uh, basically I had four or five months left in the, in the runway so I decided to leave my house in Clapham and basically soak the surf for, for a few months. Uh, so the cash that we had left, I had a lovely Romanian girl uh, called Bianca who handled marketing for three months and that just enabled me to really focus my attention on, on fundraising. He's left. <laughs> Where is he? I'm, I'm here just trying to solve a technical issue, but uh, so you met on... Uh... <laughs> Checking the clock. Okay. So, so yeah, basically um, it was just a case of trying to find new investment. Um, we obviously hit a banana skin where we thought we were going to have funding, um, but we chose not to go down that road. Okay. And then at the time, in uh, three or four months later, I was at Startup Grind. Why? Why? What made you decide um, to go there? Just to meet people, basically. I think when you're raising money, you go to these events in the hope of just trying to meet someone that could be this angel investor. Um, and I was in the audience, I stood at the back, and I remember watching Viraj on stage, um, and also Nigel Barker, a photographer. Um, I managed to sneak through a few security guards and get through to yeah. the green room. The audience, what we do is we, once a year we host a conference, always in June, in uh, Central Westminster. And this was our first one in 2016. And uh, we had about uh, 1 to 1,000 people there. And we had uh, speakers like uh, like Biraj, we had Eric Schmidt from Google, we had uh, uh, the founder of Skype and, and guys like that. And so we had security. That's why it was not hard, not easy to get to speakers like it is today. I managed to get past security. <laughs> Said hello to a few people. Um, but yeah, basically, I was really inspired by Biraj's chat. It was. Uh, we talked about the pain points of Skype and when the uh, developer who's created the technology almost gave up. And at that time I was probably, well definitely depressed, um, yeah. exhausted, working silly hours, uh, having meetings with people and that kind of inspired me to, to continue and, and basically keep going for the next three months. Okay, do you, do you remember when you, when you met, uh, when you met uh, Carl and how did you react to that? Yeah, so I was uh, minding my own business on a train back to Clapham Junction where I live uh, when this uh, uh, scouser came up to me and said, excuse me, and uh, I didn't know what to say, you know, so I said yes. He said, I think I heard you speak at Startup Right. And I was like, oh my God, I'm notorious. This is, uh, I, I apologize, you know, I was mostly joking around. Uh, so no, no, I'm an entrepreneur as well and, and I have a business and I'd like to tell you about it. Wow, uh, from Vauxhall to Clapham Junction, this is going to be a long four minutes, but go ahead. <laughs> um, so he did. I said, look, I know nothing about my pick. You know, I, I don't speak Spanish, so I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to get up here. Either. But there was something about um, the story that uh, I, I felt that, uh, you know, I, I should spend just a little bit more time. He said, let's catch up for a coffee. And uh, I said, sure, let's, let's catch up for a coffee. And we set up a time to meet. Uh, why did you decide to, to, you know, do you have many people coming up to you and, and uh, asking you for favors and doing, doing stuff, or this was an unusual situation? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, truthfully, yes. Yeah. So a lot of people ask me for advice, or they say, um, uh, could you, you know, mentor me? And the, the reality is that although I'd, I'd like to help, um, it's difficult to fit it all in. Sure. I've got, you know, wife, I've got three kids, and uh, it's, 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 it's hard. But uh, in that moment, when, when Carl came up and asked me, no, no one had actually ever done that before. Um, and I felt, yes, I, I, I do want to take that hour to, to help out a, a fellow entrepreneur. And you mentioned there was something genuine about what Carl was saying. Uh, 
what are your your tips on you know we have some startups in the audience which probably uh, are looking to get some some great advisors mentors and so on uh, what who do you think is the best way to approach somebody as busy as you are or as successful as you are uh, how would you recommend them to do it like without being too pushy or be, being too obvious into asking for favors yeah i think as an entrepreneur uh, you know, you make your own luck. So you, you know, skip past security, as called it. You know, you find somebody when, you know, they they just got themselves a drink and they're ready to have a chat. And you find those opportunities and you tune into the other person. What do they need? What do they want? What's on their mind? Like, uh, and, you know, you, you build those relationships, even if it's in a, in a short amount of time. But I think what Carl did was, uh, Exceptional because he he had to summon up his courage in that moment, uh -huh. uh, which is not a typical place. It's not like an event uh, like this one, um, and I appreciated the the fact that he seized that opportunity. Okay, Carl, uh, you seized the opportunity, and uh, how did, what was your your objective from from first talking to Diraj after you you were shocked and uh, you kind of uh, asked him for was it a meeting or an um, email? Uh, how did you do it? My recollection is a little bit different, so I was okay. slumped against the, the door of the train, and he stepped up and walked down the carriage. And as soon as I saw him, I just followed him. <laughs> Literally, oh, three yeah. seconds, and I followed him, and then stood next to him <laughs> and tapped him on the shoulder. So, uh, yeah, it was just instinct, really. I just wanted to say uh, hi. Very inspirational talk at, uh, yeah. at Startup Grind, and that gave me the kind of motivation to power on and. and yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. Yeah. And I did that and then said, can I show you the app? So I just give him a 30 second presentation. Yeah. You no, know, I, I like it because it's, uh, everybody likes a compliment, you know, no matter how successful you are, uh, the fact that you really enjoyed the presentation, you remembered it and yeah. uh, it made an impression, it's, uh, it's something which is uh, a nice thing to say. And uh, if you politely ask if you can show it, not, not just force yourself on, on, on somebody else, it's, uh, it's a good way to, to do that. Well, he didn't have anywhere to go, he was on the train. <laughs> He wasn't going to reach up and uh, the, the <laughs> stuff. Yeah. And uh, what was the follow up? Um, we just swapped cards. I sent him an email three minutes later. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, no, it was the next day, and then we just agreed to meet for coffee, and uh, I, I shared our story with him. And then, uh, uh, so, uh, Tiraj, you're not an official advisor, right? But you still are helping my pig and cow. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, I enjoy speaking with entrepreneurs. I meet entrepreneurs yeah. all the time. Uh -huh. But this was much worse than I expected. You know, okay. when, when Carl started telling me his story, then I was like, oh my goodness. I, you know, I, nothing in my experience has, has prepared me for what, you know, a fellow entrepreneur finds himself in. You know? yes. And that's what drew me in, really, because, as I said before, we went through plenty of hard times mm -hmm. of our own. But uh, that, that's the nature of the beast. That's what you get as an entrepreneur. That's part of the, that's part of the deal. Um, and, and then I thought to myself, you know, I have to do something. I have to do whatever it takes to help out Carl. It's so nice of you. And uh, uh, if you remember, Carl, your early uh, advice from, from, from Diraj, uh, uh, you mentioned earlier that you, uh, you like the, the encouragement, right? Uh, what is it uh, so valuable about uh, advice from Diraj? I think as a sole founder, you often, there's a lot of time where you're on your own and you're doing a lot of thinking, you, you're trying to work everything out and without having uh, co-founders, yeah. that's the, the hardest thing. So to, to have someone like Diraj compliment what we've done and then say, you should keep going because this is some, this could be something really good. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was just kind of encouragement more than anything really. He didn't, I didn't ask him for money. I didn't ask him for anything in terms of uh, on that side or investment mm -hmm. um it was just kind of can you help me with introductions to a network or what do you think about the situation mm -hmm. uh, there are, uh, you know being asked about uh, opening up your network to somebody's company it's a uh, it's a big ask and uh, what made you decide that it's time to to help uh, Carl in this way so i thought that every entrepreneur in their journey goes through that moment when you're on the brink of despair, where you think, I, you know, I can't do this, you know, when you are, for instance, as, as Carl told me, like sleeping on people's sofas just to, you know, save a few pounds. And in that moment, if you have someone who can be 
a shoulder to cry on, somebody who gives you a word of encouragement, somebody who does one little act of kindness, mm -hmm. that can be like all the difference. Uh, and, and I felt that it was the very least I could do. And basically what I said to Carl is, there's, there's only one way to get through this. You're gonna have to just pound the pavement to get through this situation. And I went home that night and uh, I emailed like some of my closest friends who've been through the pain of the entrepreneurial journey. And I said, we need to do whatever we can to help my new friend. Uh, and to their credit, uh, one of them even said, I'll invest in this company. I, I don't understand the business, but I'll invest if, if oh. that's what it takes. You know? wow. uh, yeah, so to that point. And I felt like this is what the community of entrepreneurs is all about, helping each other out through those darkest moments. Um, and, and that's why I was tremendously proud of what Carl did to you know, make his own luck on that train. I love it. I love it. But thank you for helping Carl so much. Carl, you told me that you, you remember the email, what it said, because it, it was a uh, really yeah, I think, uh, dramatic way, right? At the time, um, the kind of backstory is that I was trying to raise funds to uh -huh. buy some my, my shares back, basically, in, in, in essence. So I was speaking to investors saying, I need X, but I also need X to buy shares back. Um, and they, all, they were all saying no. And I think one thing that stood out for me in the email was uh, help a fellow founder in, in need. Um, but at the end of the email, it was, this is an opportunity, I don't know Carl personally, but this is an opportunity to help someone in a way that they can, that they will never forget. Yes. Um, so that really stuck with me and I was quite choked, choked by that. Yeah, and we are here to tell the tale. Well, well that's, yeah. That was awesome. Fantastic. Uh, uh, for you, the audience, you can also jump in with questions and uh, the way you do it is super simple. As you can see behind us, we have the screen and uh, uh, it's an opportunity for you to uh, just, if you want, you can take your mobile phone and open your browser. You don't need to download any, any app, you just open the browser and type in slido.com. That's it. It's as simple. And the hashtag for today is here on, on, on the site called Startup Grind. So hashtag Startup Grind. And you can just uh, start asking questions. And I promise the top uh, five, ten questions will be answered because you can tell us which ones. You can like the questions you want to have answered. So let's take the, let's take one question from, from the audience. Uh, and this is a question from Erin. Erin uh, wants to know, people say you have to take 100 rejections before you succeed. Do you agree and how do you handle rejections? <laughs> You've just got to look at it as a game. It's, uh -huh. Don't take things to heart. Um, you could get 99 no's and one yes, and that yes could be the best thing ever. So it's pretty much, yeah, don't take it to heart. Yeah. So, so I have one of these. So when, when we started Shazam, one of the things which we wanted was the same uh, number across all the, the, the mobile operators, which was 2580, straight down the middle of the mobile. Uh -huh. And for our funding, we needed to have letters of agreement from, from the operators that they would give us this number. So my business partner, who is highly persistent, he called an operator 10 times and they didn't return his calls. So he got fed up and he asked me to call. So I called them 10 times as well. They didn't return our calls. So I got bored and gave it back to him. So in total, we called this guy 43 times. 43 times we left him a voice and said, hey, we'd love to get this letter again. The 44th time he picked up the phone, we met him the following week and we got the letter. Um, wow. And so 44 times he was left. And he didn't say why he didn't pick up? Let me explain why he didn't bother to tell you. Okay. One so, day I'd name names. It's a simple lesson you just you have just keep going and, uh, and ask us. We had the found we had the CEO of Just Eat uh, here on stage and he said uh, uh, a very very simple and important lesson, a no today is not a no tomorrow. And he said when he was uh, going around restaurants and trying to convince them to, to use Just Eat, every single time he would just come uh, with a new data point. Uh, so he would visit the restaurants like every month, but telling the, the restaurants how many more orders the other restaurants in the area have. So be more contextual, not just banging his head against the wall, but telling them new data points. And eventually all of them would, uh, would say yes. But uh, it's a super simple lesson, I never forget. A no today is not a no tomorrow. So anyway, uh, 
Now, my pick now, you have fundraised, you have solved the situation with, uh, with buying out the investor. Yeah, I think um, maybe I should just get back to the survival because one okay. thing you should, shouldn't underestimate is the power of small shareholders through crowdfunding. Okay. You know, we had one investor who put in at 10, 10K originally, um, and to get us through the downtime that summer, he reinvested, I think, double his investment, and he enabled me to, to get, get that extra three or four months from away to Christmas. Yes. Um, and I was able to, to raise the funds to buy back my shares. Mm -hmm. um, and then three or four months later, we raised 1.3 million. Okay. So that was to get it to overcome the obstacle, never underestimate the power of the small shareholders who are willing to keep keep you going to, to get to the, the, main, the main goal. Yes. So the challenge of fundraising is, is uh, was solved. Uh, yeah. What other challenges did you face and uh, how did you solve them? After, after, after the fundraising. Yeah, so initially with the, the small budget that we had, we outsourced to, to Argentina. Mm -hmm. So with the, the one million round, we basically took the team in-house um, from front end to back end developers and we tried to keep it lean, but obviously the cost of, of operations in London is a lot higher than Argentina. Okay. Um, so that's the one thing we noticed, the, the difference in, in spending. Mm -hmm. And where is Viper now? Where is the company? Right now, we've got a team of six plus about four or five freelancers that dip in and out. Uh -huh. uh, we've outsourced some of the front end to Istanbul. Um, some guys are remote from West London, so we've kind of got the, the mix of the two now, um, which I think is a, is a, lot, is a lot leaner. Mm -hmm. um, we've got around about 100,000 100, artists on the platform, photographers um, and artists to kind of upload their content and, and sell them as physical products. Um, yeah, we're growing. We've got some, some new team members and um, we've found some new shareholders again in the last six months um, who are with us today yeah. and just trying to basically scale the team, scale in the business. Okay, nice. So well done for not giving up and going because the company sounds uh, pretty awesome. Uh, uh, Dinash, I know that you uh, are not using the service, but uh, your wife does. Is it true? Yeah, that's right. So my wife is an enthusiastic MindPick user. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks to Carl, and uh, yeah, I would definitely recommend if you haven't tried it, then then check it out. Uh, but I don't use Shazam that much either. I just live in ignorance. So. Okay. Uh, Carl, you have this, this art uh, background, and uh, there are some use cases in the art space which uh, which are quite successful. Even one of them. Uh, could you tell us about that? Yeah. So basically, obviously, through the power of Instagram, is now the discovery platform. So we wanted to complement Instagram artists and photographers. Uh -huh. um, there's a few, you may have heard of a lady called Sarah Shakil, who's a crystal artist. Um, she's based in Islamabad, Pakistan. She a, was a dentist student and she grew her account to like 800,000 followers on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, we partnered with her and she, she uploaded, I think, 15 pictures to our platform um, and then shared four stories and she made 20,000 in, in six days. So basically, just through the power of her following on Instagram, it generated traffic to my pick. Wow. And then there was customers in San Francisco, Dubai, Australia, who were all really proud of her owning her art. That's awesome. Uh, Dinesh, how often do you meet uh, with Carl? Or do, are, you, are you sometimes having calls? Or what's your uh, nature of your relationship with uh, helping him? Sure. So, so we're now friends because uh, you know, nothing makes me happier than to see another entrepreneur's success. Yes. And you know, going through those stages of growth and seeing you know, investors coming on board and seeing the growth uh, in the business and uh, you know, being able to talk about it with, with others, but I know that it's a long story. Uh, you know, and there's lots of ups and downs through growing a business through to, to exit. And I'm there when when Carl has a question or if he says, "Hey, you know, I'm going through this latest round. Do you have any advice?" Uh, and I think that's that's what it's all about to be able to, I guess, share those lessons learned and uh, be able to help each other out. And that's what I. Uh, really value now about this community in London and and beyond is uh, you know feeling that sense of community. Uh, and when you you go and speak uh, quite a lot at the different conferences and, and events, uh, do you still are you still open to meeting other entrepreneurs? And uh, uh, what elements uh, convince you about some entrepreneurs that uh, they are worth spending time to listen to to the to the pitch, and which ones are not? Sure. So so my focus now is what I call tech for good. So. Um, entrepreneurs who are building businesses which are solving some of the, the, the biggest societal challenges. Yes. And I think there's a huge opportunity for uh, young people in particular to take you know, a different view of using entrepreneurship and technology to address some really intractable problems where it could be you know, climate change, it could uh -huh. be you know, hunger, it could be 
uh, some pollution that we're seeing. And these are not things which I know about, but I feel I learned so much from the conversations with, uh, you know, people who have the same kind of like dreams, the same ambition, the same drive, but not just about, you know, making a load of money, but really having an impact. So that's where I spend the majority of my time. Okay. Uh, Carl, uh, in, uh, in my pick, you have a clear vision. Uh, how, what's the big picture? Where do you want to get? And how far down the road are you right now? The big picture, I would like my pick to be the print platform for the internet. Uh -huh. um, whether you're selling images through Instagram or just generating images on holiday with like, family pictures, um, we're trying to bring premium products to an affordable mass for everyone. Um, yeah, so I think obviously there's multiple print companies out there. There's some companies that have been going for 20 years, but I think my pick as a, as a brand could be the next big brand that, that kind of dominates the space. Okay, fingers crossed it's going to be. I hope uh, so. Yes. Let's now to go to some questions. Uh, uh, we have a question from Yogi. How do you manage to keep people in your startup during turbulent times? <laughs> I think it's all about the vision really and, and persistence. If you've got someone um, who's cheering from the front and, and unwilling to, not wavering, I think the staff, um, they kind of get on board with that. Um, if, if they see weakness in me, then obviously things will fall apart um, a lot quicker. But um, yeah, I think basically incentivize staff, um, don't be a hard ass, and basically just try and keep everything le level. Yeah. Yeah, in your company, I remember when you had hard times, and there were multiple uh, at Shazam, did you have any issues with people wanting to leave in, in big numbers and uh, not really? No, I don't recall that. What I recall is what, what Carl said is that's pulling together as a team because you're having this really intense experience. You know, it's a, it's a rare opportunity to have this ride, which, is, which we know as a startup. And just to... I guess be genuine through the, the ups and downs, which is, you know, it's like, um, we're in this together. Let's try to enjoy, enjoy even the pain. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not the safe course of action. It's not the rational thing to do. Let's, let's try to get through it on the other side. Um, and I think that's what uh, my experience has been, is that, you know, you have to stand up and be strong and lead from the front. But as well, like the team is what's carrying you because without that, you're, you're, you're nothing as a, as a business. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it makes a huge difference if we can en enable that feeling of pulling in the same direction. Yes. Okay, next question is uh, from Anonymous. Uh, I know his last name. Any advice to recent graduate founders with little to no ex career experience? If somebody is a, uh, is a graduate and now has no experience, any advice for what, what they should do? I didn't have any experience whatsoever other okay. than architecture, so I, okay. I jumped and basically hired people from Gumtree and someone introduced me to a, a web agency and I interviewed a guy and basically just go and speak to people, go to events, don't be afraid um, to look a fool, basically just say hello to people, um, swap cards, have coffee, if you've got an idea, explore things with them um, and if they're keen to build something either for equity or for a small amount of cash, then try and partner with people. Obviously, you can't do everything on your own, so just surround yourself with good people. Okay, uh, next question is for Diaz. Uh, Diaz, what tools, techniques, or habits have you found the most useful for your business? So, uh, you know, uh, I had the, the, the good fortune uh, at Shazam to work with really close friends, and we brought a different strengths to the table. So, so Chris, for instance, he is very goal oriented, very like, he can get fixated on problem solving, very persistent. Uh -huh. um, Philippe, my other business partner, he's like, he's got like superhuman powers. He can do eight things at once, you know, while kite surfing. It's incredible, right? Uh -huh. So there's just high kind of like action orientation gets stuff done. Yes. Um, I'm exactly the opposite. So I, I prefer to just, you know, uh, have a good time and, and, and have fun and just kind of go with the flow. And, and that, uh, in my team, basically, let me see the, the bigger picture or to, uh, you know, see a, a wider story. Sometimes setting disagreements because when things would get like, locked into you know, points of view. Um, and I guess that my, my, my philosophy is that you know, if one brings together people who have 
similar values, you know, enjoy spending time with each other, but have different styles, different things that makes them tick, that makes for a really powerful team. Um, and, uh, you know, I was really fortunate that we had that combination at, at Shazam, and I wish that on other people here who are starting their businesses as well, which is finding that partner or partners who can really complement your strengths and get you through those hard times. That's a really good answer. Uh, Carl, anything to add? On the stars and guides, yeah, on the habits, uh, techniques, habits, tools, which uh, help you to be more, most useful for business. Well, one of my, uh, my lead iOS developer, Shibuya, um, he uh -huh. introduced all of the, the kind of tech uh, software stuff. I had no idea what Slack was or um, what was the other one we used. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, basically, like, uh, surround yourself with tech guys who you know what they do. I'm a designer by trade, so I, I basically um, love the design side, but you need people like Dan who helps with finance advice and, uh, and, and stuff like that. Okay, uh, Diaz, I want to ask you about uh, about Shazam because you talked about the future of MyPick. Uh, what do you think about the acquisition by, by Apple, and uh, where do you see the future of uh, of Shazam now when it's big uh, part of this big big family as a founder? Yeah, so we were delighted when when Apple bought Shazam just because we felt that it was a really good fit. We'd known uh, Apple since the very early days of yeah. when the App Store launched, and uh, you know their care for the user experience. Uh, the fact that you know music is really uh, at the heart of, of their business, uh, and also Shazam is continuing as a as a standalone brand and business, which is which is nice. But for instance, if you use Siri, if you say, "Hey Siri, what's that song?" That's Shazam power of it, mm -hmm. and you know we, hopefully we'd see more of Shazam's technology in, mm -hmm. in the Apple kind of like family. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, so all positive, and looking forward to the future, but without knowing what it actually looks like. Okay, mm -hmm. is there a question here from uh, uh, Anonymous again about uh, not only sold, what's your, what's your future, but you already mentioned that you uh, involved with uh, impact investing and you also invest in low rate as well, so what's your future now? Yeah, that's right, I think that um, I'm getting more and more into like philanthropy and um, for instance, um, there's a, a charity called the Queen's Commonwealth Trust, mm -hmm. which helps social entrepreneurs uh, across the Commonwealth. And um, I, I'm trying to think about how I can help them out to um, you know, give people, not just in this country, but all over the world, with some of those ideas, those moments of inspiration, that word of encouragement, that tool which can help them you know, get to the next step. But it's a long, hard journey, we all know that. Yeah. But what can we do to take uh, the benefit of what we've learned and, and spread that, uh, and then again, ideally to have a, a positive impact in the long term? So that's. That's where my, my time and my thoughts are going to. Okay, Carl, uh, talk about positive impact uh, with uh, with my pick. Uh, what is the vision? How uh, so? Uh, you mentioned social media, Instagram. It's uh, it's something a tool which uh, which is helping my pick. Uh, how do you think is is my pick helping uh, people users uh, to make their, their well, lives better? Ultimately, it's, there's, there is a cause for good. I know we, we sell physical products, um, but we kind of we help artists and photographers turn their images into products and they earn a percentage of, of the sale. Um, so for me, working with, if it's a celebrity artist or if someone wants to sell a pillow to their aunt, they make cash just from an upload, which is, for me, um, there's no better feeling than when I see a 50-year-old guy in Norway say, hey, I've just uploaded a picture to my pick and made 40 pounds. Yeah. So that's, I think, the power of using other people's imagery instead of going to, to retailers to buy mass-produced stuff that you, you don't know who the creator was. Yes. Um, I think it's cool to be able to sit here with your image on my t-shirt knowing that you've made 10 pounds. That's, that's the kind of approach that we're looking towards. Okay, I'll ask you while you're on, on, on the microphone one more question regarding how did you push aside the fear of failure, you know, homelessness, losing everything to find the motivation to make my pick succeed? I think you've just got to be an insane dreamer of, uh, you've got to just dream outrageous things and that something is going to happen. Um, if you would have told me when I was in front of Devaj on stage that we would raise a million pounds a year later, I would have said you were crazy. But you've got to just dream outrageously big um, and overcome things, but just, just aim it as high as you can. Okay. Uh, Devaj, on this note, you know, we have. Uh, we all know people who uh, are these big dreamers, 
but they can't be, be, be delusional because they, they believe in idea and the idea all their friends know it doesn't gonna work but they still keep, keep fighting and fighting and they do this for too long where do you draw the line of of kind of getting defeated from people uh, versus not listening to them and just be stubborn as, as a founder should be uh, what do you think is, is the, the healthy way of, of knowing uh, whether you should, should give up and it's not gonna do it's not gonna work and, and start a new idea or or keep persevering yeah, I think the best way to do it is to keep a balance in life, and that means to eat well, to work out, to have you know a family life, to have a hobby, to meditate. Um, so that you know, being an entrepreneur is is a job. It shouldn't become a life. Yes. Uh, and to have that mental balance to be able to say, I'm going to dig deep, even though everyone says no. But I think where it goes wrong is you can create uh, mental scars if you just you know, completely burn yourself out. Uh, but at the end of the day, I don't think anyone else can tell you uh, what's wrong or right. It, you have to look inside yourself. And the best way to have that strength of uh, mind and heart is to look after yourself and, and your, your team and, and uh, you know, take each day as it comes. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, uh, on this note, like having a good, good quality life, like now after the, now after the exits, would you buy a, a huge yacht and a big castle in Scotland and uh, enjoy life, or not? Not to be too extreme. What's your version yeah. of having a good life? So, so I was away for for a week in California with my son. In the ah. meantime, my wife has completely rearranged the house. So I've been kicked out of my study. I'm now in the guest room. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I've been downscaled while <laughs> while I was away. So no, unfortunately, my, my dreams of the yacht and the house, uh, this castle in Scotland, have not worked out. No. <laughs> not yet. Okay. Uh, no, not, no, no, not at all. Yeah, I'm not not into those kind of material things. Just to be clear. Okay. There's a very interesting question here uh, for you, Carl. Carl, how do you consider the environmental challenges the society is facing? For example, with my pick, uh, carbon footprint, outsourcing, recycling products, and so on. Uh, what's your take on that? Okay, so what, one thing that we tried to do last year was focus on. Um, partner with different manufacturers in different continents. So when we launched, it was just about products in the UK, it was kind of made in England approach. But obviously shipping to to Singapore or Australia or the US, yeah. um, there's a big impact there. So we basically partnered with uh, art manufacturing companies and printers in California, in New York, in, um, in Central Europe, in, in Australia. So we're trying to create products that are made and shipped locally. Uh, cheaper shipments and cheaper. Uh, cheaper okay, so you don't worry about that. Yeah. Yeah, well, hold on. Uh, <laughs> next one, I'd like to I'd like to ask you: uh, Do you advise to work on the side until the business starts to bring money? Sorry, say that. Do you advise to work on the side until the business starts to bring money? For for early starts of founders. Yes. Yes. So um, a consulting or being part uh, partly employed. Yeah, I've always had two jobs. So whether it was full time in uni, the art shop, I was working 60, 70 hours as an architect, but I would always do um, external projects. Uh -huh. you, you should, you know, basically fund fund your passion with with other services, whether it be consulting or anything else. Okay. You still have two jobs now. Me now? Yeah, you oh well, as you mentioned, um, Roll has been working really hard this last week, um, and to coincide with this, uh, we've we've launched a blog called thesoulfounder.com, oh. um, and it's basically kind of tribute to soul fa founders, and they can reach out to me, and I, I want to share my experiences, some ecstatic, some horrific. Um, yeah, so that's we've been working on that alongside uh, my business last week. So it's the okay. founder. So as, as you heard here, uh, you know, Diraj has uh, there were three co-founders, if I heard correctly, and uh, you kind of had these complementary skill sets, and uh, it makes things a bit easier. But uh, uh, Carl, when he was starting, he was so founder is really really hard, and uh, for this uh, he put together some 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 lessons, some uh, uh, things he's learned along the way. Uh, can you please tell us the, the website again? The soulfounder.com. Soul founder. So we're going to be sending out an email with uh, the summary of the pictures in the video and uh, we'll add the link to the to, to website as well. So what is the next uh, for my pick for the rest of this year? What's your plan? I'd like to scale the team, marketing, help the user base, um, increase the product selection, um, 
we just added new features, which is really trying to focus on the, the sellers and the artists, uh -huh. as opposed to MyPick being a, a hub platform. We want to try and be a, a, a kind of marketing service for them. Yes. Um, so we don't want MyPick to be above your name. We want it to be, you're the shop, this is your store, um, and just help the users in any way to, to market their product. Okay. Uh, Diyash, what is your plan for this year? My plan for this year, I think, is to just follow my, my passion and, and I'm getting drawn more and more to, uh, you know, learning more about problems which I can't solve, yes. as opposed to helping people with, uh, you know, experience which I already have. And that's one of the things which I love about working with younger people is that, uh, you know, you're in a mode where you're learning, you're absorbing information, you think anything is possible. As you get older, you rely more on what you know, your, your world tends to narrow and you become, uh, I guess, maybe fewer possibilities. So I'm trying to be, uh, you know, less 50, which are now, and more 23, uh, but who knows where this is going to go. Okay. Uh, I want to ask each of you, if you would start again, what would you do differently? No, okay. I wouldn't start again, it's too tired. If I would start again, it would be with two other people. It's hard on your own to do it. Very okay. hard. Pilar, what's your big, big... Uh, as an entrepreneur? Yes, um, as an entrepreneur. So the, the business which we started was extremely capital intensive upfront. Uh -huh. So we, so the first round we raised was eight and a half million dollars yes. in 2001, which is stupidity. Um, so I would look at businesses where you can get a bit more proof as you go along without making a big bet upfront. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's just more sensible to understand, is this a problem which the world wants solved, yes or no, yes. and then kind of go from there, yes. Okay, wow. Uh, let's take two more questions from, from Slido, and then we can wrap it up, and then we can uh, do some networking. Uh, the question on Slido which we're going to take is, uh, uh, maybe from, from Jaram, uh, what were your top key, key ways of gaining users and growing the business? Yeah, so when we first launched, we tried a range of marketing tactics, not knowing what would work and what wouldn't. Uh -huh. And what worked for us was we uh, had radio ads and we would say, there's a new service in the UK which you can use your mobile phone to identify your song. Just dial 2580 straight down the, uh, the middle of your mobile uh -huh. and try it on the next song now. And it would go into music, and we made sure that song was in our, <laughs> our database. It would always work. Yes. And that's how we got our initial kind of spikes of traffic and awareness and, and so forth. Nice, yeah. super simple idea. Uh, what I'd like to say now uh, for you, Carl, is that uh, uh, this uh, this thing you do, you, you see someone, you, you walk, you look up to them, and you talk to them. Uh, I think you you have very good. Uh, way of, of dealing with uh, people at conferences. So for example, this summer, uh, we had this, this pre-party before the conference again, and uh, you saw me, woke up, woke, woke up to me and told me the story, because I didn't know. And uh, if you wouldn't tell me the story, you, you wouldn't be sitting here right, right now. So uh, I think the, the successful entrepreneurs, they have this gift of seizing the opportunity, because we never know how uh, you walking up to somebody and, and pitching the business or, but being polite while doing it. Uh, uh, with respect, uh, how far this is going to get you because uh, true story, I, I did not know about the story and uh, then I, I wouldn't be able to do anything about it but uh, Carl told me, we had the founder of Startup Grind in the room, I, I got him again, I uh, recorded the video instantly with yeah. you and you I think I, I walked past you at the bar and tapped you and said, is your name Marion? We met two years ago. Yeah. Um, I just want to kind of tell you something what happened since we met. And then uh -huh. he took me into a room and shoved a, a phone in my face and then I, I kind of told him the story. And then the, the CEO, Derek, uh, got in touch and wanted to meet me at, at the conference. So um, we exhibited at the conference and it's, it's really good to, uh, to catch up. Give us two or three, three tips how you recommend to, to upcoming founders how, how to behave at the conference, how to seize the opportunity there. Try and be po polite, not too pushy. Um, if you see a, three or four people surrounding a, a speaker or an investor, just know where you are in the queue and don't get too, too, uh, too, too, much, too much front. But yeah, just be polite and obviously when people are talking on stage or investors, um, they get hammered by people, like 20 people in, in 20 minutes. So you've got to give them 10 seconds or 15 seconds that will, will hook them in to, to actually look you in the eye and listen. Yes. 
And on this note, please join me in thanking uh, Diraj from Shazam and Carl from Magic. Yeah, I just want to say um, that this is why I love being with entrepreneurs because I learn something new every day. So I've learned so much from Carl, from you know how he handled that situation and how he handled you know what happened next. And this is the great thing I think is that it's a constant learning experience and it has been for me to meet Carl. So thank you again. Thank you.